The idea of core values for the church has been a growing phenomenon for about the last 25 years. Um, they're usually written after a church writes an impressive vision statement with the assumption that discerning a vision statement will automatically fix any decline or problems that the church has. It'll deal with and nullify any negative behaviors and increase the overall congregational effectiveness. The vision statement doesn't do that. The vision statement points you in the direction that God is calling you to become. You're not there yet. You're in process. Many churches, after spending years of setting goals and making plans based upon their carefully crafted words, and sometimes they'll take a couple years to craft those words, report that there are no improvements or growth or their, in their ministry effectiveness. And when the church analysis people, I kind of fall into that category a little bit, uh, look really closely at this, what they see is that less and less experimentation took place to support that vision. And instead, they cast a vision and then just kept doing everything business as usual. They didn't change the core of what the church functions, identifies, and operates around. They didn't change their core values. What has been discovered is that congregational behavior does not stem from what is written on paper, but from the core values that is lived out every day by a church's membership, by its body. Congregations that tend to grow, act, and serve on these core values and seldom reach unrealistic goals of 10 new members a month, five new families a month, everyone learning new songs in a month, doubling our size of our congregation by the end of the year. I'm sorry, but the church is a living, breathing organism, and when our bodies hurt. Our physical bodies hurt. Like my right hip is screaming at me in pain. You might have noticed me hobbling a little bit instead of having my typical stalwart walk. It takes time to heal and to fix because this internal pain in my tuchus. Sorry? Anybody I know? No, I spent all day mudding and plastering my basement. <laughs> it, all about this high. So. But it takes time for that to heal and to change. And without proper treatment and focusing on the treatment and doing what needs to be done to heal this and make it better, I'll have this pain the rest of my life if I don't take care of it. A congregation who does not have a defined set of core values is unable to grow. It's unable to grow toward or support its vision statement because the standards of what defines the nature of the congregation as a servant people or whatever type of people need to grow into becoming a witnessing and ministering body of ministry. So the idea of let's come up with these new ideas but not do anything to grow towards them. Well, as one of my psych professors told me a long time ago, that is the living operational definition of insanity. So here's the question. What are core values? To understand the powerful nature of core values, you need to think of an apple. And I had one set aside on my counter, but in my tardiness of running out the door this morning, I left it there. So picture for me in your minds, if you will, your favorite apple. Mine is a Honeycrisp. I don't know what yours is, but if you want to picture a Honeycrisp with me, that would be just fine. Take a reasonably sized knife, not one this long, cut it in half, and what do you see on the inside of that apple? Seeds. Those seeds are the core values of the apple. 
It is the core value of what the apple tree will become. They create the future of that life that can come out of that seed. And it is the same way in the church. Core values are our seeds. Seeds that create the future of who we are to become in our ministries, in our organization, in our membership, and in the staff members that you call to help make those vision pieces and core values come to pass. A congregation's core values are to become deeply ingrained patterns and thoughts of behaviors, beliefs, and actions which motivate us into ministries to shape the journey of our congregation's understanding of how the good news of Jesus' birth, ministry, crucifixion, and resurrection continuously transform our lives from living as people who just live lives by a holy standard that is not of this world but live our lives by a standard that has been set forth by our Heavenly Father. Core values are those things which we measure our effectiveness of our growth in becoming vessels of light in a world of darkness. Basically, if you wonder how your, how your walk with the Lord is going, all you need to do is to look at your walk and compare it to the core values. It helps us live our lives each day. It helps us assess our walk and to give us patterns, opportunities, and even invitations to grow. Core values are those beliefs and convictions inspired by our relationship with God when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. At the time of our conversion, and that's what it's supposed to be, a conversion, a change, we receive the gift of salvation. We give ourselves over to God so we are truly transformed by the Holy Spirit into becoming the people God has created and called us to become. Sometimes we overlook the importance of a salvific event. When we say, yes, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. Yes, God, I want to be better than what this world has taught me to be. I want to be a vessel of your light in all that I do, not just in the lip service in the time that I give on a Sunday morning. When a church identifies and uses, I see you can identify them but never use them. Talk about that in a little bit. When they use the core values, then the beliefs of these values become expressed in our ministries of how we reflect where God is calling us to grow, share, and serve. The activities which build our little body within the kingdom right here in our little segment, corner, whatever you want to call it, of Waterford. The policies and documents that we use to govern and make our decisions, the leadership we vote into office, and the staff we call to shepherd and help grow the church into its future. The sad thing is that a lot of churches put together their core values. And these are churches that are struggling. They print them in nice pamphlets post them on websites, put them on their Facebook page, bring them up every once in a while in a Twitter feed, make a nice poster that goes on the wall, put them in the projection of a Sunday morning service, but they become invisible. They take up space, but they don't take root. They work and establish them, but then they never take them to heart. This is because the congregation continues to submerge itself into the practice and the mindset of, this is the way we've always done things. In other words, they've imprisoned themselves to what's familiar and comfortable instead of trusting a God who has promised to be with them, protect them, guide them, and lead them into paths of righteousness to grow the kingdom. I know how harsh this sounds. And I know for some of you it's going to make you uncomfortable. But here's the bottom line question that's been asked to me for some time. Why are some of these churches growing and why are they not? This is why. So then what causes a congregation's core values? Well, as I alluded a little earlier about the pain in my hip, 
Just as the physical health of human being derives from multiple causes, such is exercise, diet, the gene pool that we've been generated out of, the stress that we carry. The actual core values of congregations derive from a complex mixture of many, many factors. But I'm going to give you the top three. Theological focus, core value-driven ministries, and congregational willingness. Now, I'm going to explain each one of these a little more deeply. Theological focus, in its most simplistic definition, and when it comes to theology, there are volumes and volumes and volumes written about it. But in its most simplistic definition, it is the study of God and how that study impacts one's religious beliefs. A number of years ago, I worked with a church, and they were kind of going through a little bit of a kind of a revival piece. So we were teaching a lot of the basics of what it meant to be in the Christian faith. And who showed up at the church but, for lack of a better term, the town bum? You could smell the alcohol coming after off of him as he came into the church. And when he came to me this morning, he went, good morning, pastor. And I went, good morning. It was toxic. And he sat there. And he sang the hymns beautifully. And he prayed. I mean, he had a posture of humility. I know this because I was watching him. Did the teaching and the sermon... I guess it was okay. Never ask me how I did. I let, I let the spirit kind of do its thing. But he comes up after me and he goes, Yep, preacher, I got that right here. I got that right here. I said, really? I'd love to talk with you about that for a few minutes. Do you have some time? You know, everyone's almost gone. He goes, no. The local, whatever the place was called at the corner, is opening up pretty soon and, and I need to get there. He needed to get his booze fix. What was his core value? He might have Jesus in his heart, but he was living a lifestyle that was literally destroying him. What was his core value? Theological focus. Encourage people to grow spiritually in our relationship with God. In other words, we don't sit there and go, well, you know what it means to be a Christian. We help them discover and define what it means to be a Christian. You know who God is. You know what the Holy Spirit is. You know who Jesus is. You know what the Bible is and what it's for. You know. Why we say you know has always puzzled me. Instead of making personal, personable, identified statements, God is this to me. Jesus is this to me. The Holy Spirit is this for me. For me, it's a very simple package. God is the one who is above me. My Savior, Jesus the Christ, walks beside me. And the Spirit, because of Jesus and God's love for me, is always with me in me. But we try to explain it in all these very complex fashions because we don't take the time to stop and figure out what all of this means. It helps us to love our neighbors both in church, in the community, and in the world. And it gives us opportunities to experiment with things outside of our normal comfort zones because we recognize that this is where God is calling us to be. This is what God is calling us to do. And we recognize and are comfortable with the fact that we know that God will be with us. Then you have the core value-driven ministries. These are ministries or behaviors that a congregation emphasizes, which arise from deeply held values that they have within themselves have been taught or presented to them by a pastor, previous pastor, previous pastors. Have you looked at the wall of heritage out here? That's how much influence you have. 
in cycles and generations that have impacted you. Some things, we don't even remember those folks, but what they brought has affected us. It's not always a bad thing to sit there and look at it. It's actually a good thing to celebrate. Here's our heritage. This is what we've learned from these people. They affect how we think and operate when it comes to church. You also, your core values can also be worked by influential lay leaders, people who either serve on boards or have a strong voice within the body. They can also be influenced by bullies that you have in the congregation. These are the folks who have the two-year-old behavior that if you don't do it my way, I'm going to take my toys and go home. The core value then becomes one of fear instead of one of holy embrace. Year after year, a congregation that is not growing into or living out its core values will tend to live out a ministry and existence that is based upon the thinking, planning, and behaviors of one, if not all four areas that I just listed at the same time. Having so many values, so many ideas swirling around, they collide, they create confusion, and you have great difficulty in knowing what's God calling us to do because we have so many things happening at once. The last one of the top three is congregational willingness. Now, congregations that struggle, that don't have core values, will tend to plan their ministries based on what the membership wants to do, not what God is calling them to do. For example, in the Sunday school and educational pieces, the question will be, what do you want to study next? Instead of, what do you hear God calling us to learn? In missions, they'll say, well, what missions do you want to support? Instead of teaching and saying, you know, hey, these ministries that we can partner with really help us grow into and accentuate our core values. Worship will ask, what kind of songs do you want to sing? instead of taking bold steps and statements to kind of go, hey, here's a new way to bring you closer to God, to be invigorated by the Spirit, to understand what His Son has done for us. This means that the congregation, the people, y'all, control the spiritual climate and growth movement of the body, not the vision, not the core values, not the presence of God. This lifestyle practice of ministry never challenges us to rock the boat or calls us to have wonder about God or questions of, do you really believe that? For a people of God to be effective in its calling to grow, serve, and share as a called and saved people, a core value-driven ministry must support the vision and match the context of the ministry which God has called the church to serve. You see, it's more than saying this is what's important. It's the internal peace that drives and grows us. The easiest set of core values that I've been able to find, and if you try to Google search core values in the scriptures, do you know what you find? The core values of various churches. There is no place in the Bible that talks specifically about core values. We have recognized that this is really a human institution that we use to help us grow closer to what God wants us to be, to understand and to serve and to grow. Yes, we're taking a page out of what a lot of successful businesses are doing, and it's one of the few places that I agree with that practice. But the core values becoming the seeds are very important. At the time when the scriptures were written, there was already an understanding of what the core values were. In the time of Moses, it started with the Ten Commandments. Jesus came back and kept taking them back to the Ten Commandments, the essence of what they were about, the little nitty-gritty stuff, not all the extra explanations that are on the outside of it. And well, there was a whole lot of stuff that happened in between. Every time God sent a prophet, 
It was because the Hebrew nation had gotten away from its core values. The judges were to help keep them straight on their core values. When God would appoint a king, it was a king who would uphold the Jewish core values. And if I was to surmise what those would be, start with the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses. Now, there are two versions of this. There's the one that you find in Exodus, which is short and sweet, and a lot of people gravitate towards that one. I actually prefer the version that is found in the book of Deuteronomy, and that's the one that we're going to look at right now. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Here's the value. You shall have no other gods before me. Here's the explanation. You shall not make unto yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth below, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children of iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation to those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. My favorite bumper sticker of all time was on a really dilapidated car. It was probably the thing that was holding the back bumper on the car. It was very simple. God's last word is not damn. Go ahead, laugh about it. Think about every time we make that God's last name. That person's core value was to make sure that God's name was always holy. While I found it humorous, I also found it humbling. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to love the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and, me, your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Everyone needs to take a break. Take that time and give it to God. Don't work for yourself. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. At this time in the world... In the known world, do you know what a work, work week consisted of? Seven days, sun up to sundown, till you dropped. That's right. This was a bold cultural statement. The Hebrew slaves worked seven days a week, sun up to sundown, and now God is commanding them to chill, to enjoy. To rest. And there's a real genius behind that. A lot of folks in this world of ours believe that you work so you can rest. But if you look at the medical impact of that, it's completely backwards. We rest so we can work. We allow our bodies and our minds to recover so we can fill the responsibilities that we have. There are some people, God love them, and they thoroughly mystify me, that can go 100 miles an hour seven days a week. I don't get that. I can't do that. I need my downtime. I need my time to think. I need my time to nap. I need my time to just sit and, as the meditationists say it, sit quietly and knock on the sky. I sit with my eyes closed and I breathe and I just 
take in what's going on around me. We are to honor our father and our mothers as the Lord God commanded you, so that your days may be long and that you may go well, that it may go well with you in the land of the Lord your God that is giving you. You know, there were days growing up I adored my mother. I respected my father. But I was convinced he was the dumbest man on the face of the earth. Until I got older. Until I walked a day in his shoes. Until I saw everything that he dealt with. I had to wait until my late teenage years where I began to honor my father. You know what the funny thing was? Is when I started to do that, my mother got jealous. I finally had to say, Mom, i got to love you both equally. I valued her over him. And what I didn't realize is that he was making everything she did possible. That's not a proud statement for you to make. That's a secret I'd like to take to my grave. But if I honor God and I value the time that we have together, then that honesty is necessary. Ouch. Hopefully we learn something from it. God says you shall not murder. You shall not intentionally try and succeed in taking someone's life. Neither shall you commit adultery. You will honor the person God has called you to be with. You shall not steal. Do I need to explain that one? Didn't think so. Neither shall you bear false witness against your brother. A little white lie about someone is bearing false witness. Lying flat out to manipulate individuals or a crowd to your favor against someone else's integrity is bearing false witness. God himself wrote every one of these ten core values for God's people. They were placed before them in order to help the entire community of faith have a focused life of living and mindset of God. A mindset that reveals God's hand providing for their daily bread, God's spirit guiding and making smart and healthy choices, God's love to be freely shared with friends, family, and strangers, God's blessings falling upon others in each and every day. We see it. We point it out. But for us here in this time, in this place, as I look out among you, as I look at this church and it's getting ready to move forward, there is not a consensus upon what we believe about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And by a lot of you that I've spoken with, yes, you have your ideas and you have your beliefs. But there has not been an intentional step to kind of say, we as a body resonate here with this idea. Let me ask a couple examples, a couple sample questions. When it comes to God, does God just make things, things happen in our lives regardless of what we do? Or does God offer opportunities that allows us to choose or not choose to follow him? Does God make things... I'm sorry, I just read that one. Did Jesus come to this earth to save us? To help us overcome our sins so they no longer separate us from God? Or did he just come to show us what it means to have a righteous life? Does the Holy Spirit only give us spiritual gifts? Or is it a holy presence that is constantly with us to help us transform and to grow from the moment we say yes to our Savior to the moment God calls us home? What about sin? People get uncomfortable when you talk about sin. Is sin just a cosmic force that is unleashed to destroy God's goodness? Or is it the choices that we make that turn us away from God? 
What about humanity? What about humankind? Was humankind created to love and obey God and receive God's blessings? Or are we just, a fall, are we just fallen because of our sin and can only be saved when God makes the first move? When God reaches out to us? What about the Bible? Is it written without error, where it stands in its truth, and the truth will stand the test of time? Or was it written to be one of many avenues to be able to come into the presence of God, but must be rewritten and applied to a more modern time and standards? Is God's words eternal, or do we get to change it because the world has changed? I've said this before. When I look at congregations that are growing, I begin to research what makes them tick. And I'll find one of two things. One, they're putting on a great stage production every time they open their doors. And folks are just wanting to come in for a happy, joy, lift-me-up feeling. But they do nothing to grow the people in their faith. The ones that are growing. The ones where the people are all about service and growing the kingdom. They have a clear understanding and a clear consensus and a clear growth, and a clear growth pattern of who God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are, what place humanity has within this world in God's creation, and the role that Scripture serves, not only when we gather on a Sunday morning to worship, but each and every day of our lives. When I talk to the pastors that I have known over the years, all of their shepherding, teaching, preaching, and care resonates in these growing churches out of these core values. But what is more impressive is that when I talk with the members of the congregations, it is their actions, their excitement, and the means of serving that resonate the exact same core values. When you go to search for your next pastor, you want to have someone with the same core values you have. If you don't, what do you have? Collision after collision after collision after collision. How is that building the kingdom of God up? I don't think it is. They have a shared theological focus and that is the body with the core value-driven ministry. That is the body who seeks to follow the calling of the Holy Spirit wherever it will lead them because they have allowed the Spirit working through those core values to bring them into truly one mind, one body, one people who are truly under God. By the time Jesus had come along to the Jewish people, whom God saved through Moses, gave the Ten Commandments for them to value to their inner core of being, and they became a group that was divided into ten dominant religious groups, each one proclaiming to possess the true understanding of how to live as the child of God. We usually hear in the scriptures about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Occasionally hear about the Zealots. There were seven others. And Jesus combated elements of all of them, trying to bring them back to the Heavenly Father. In every moment of teaching, Jesus had. In every moment of confrontation, healing, where he liberated people, Jesus was constantly pointing back to these ten core values written in God's hands, given to the Jewish people. And asking the people before him, what does this mean to you? How do you live this meaning that you have of God every day in your life? How do you see the blessings of God upon you and in the world around you? Some of the folks could answer them clearly. Some of them could not. They had gotten away from what it meant to be the chosen people. So God sent his son to save them. 
he didn't reinvent the core values. He highlighted them. But to help people along, he gave a couple of very powerful teachings to apply. And I'm going to talk about those next week. I've struggled as to how to end this teaching moment, and I do not have a written conclusion like I normally would. I could stand here and dance and jig, but I really have no rhythm. I could try and make something up, but I don't think it would hold the integrity of what I've said. Other than to say, congregations that don't have core values for me as a pastor, scare me. Because I'm looking for the points that drives this place. And coming together, because we've always come together, leaves me cold. As a pastor, I look for churches that are hungry and want to grow in the spirit, want to use the gifts that I have to take them from where they are to where they need to be. And I want to know what they're about. Their history is good. Yes, it influences who they are in that moment. But I want to know where God's taking them and what are the tenets that they're revolving around so I know how to insert myself into the equation of pastor and church. You see, this is just not an exercise that I'm trying to introduce to you folks. It's not just an assessment. We've got the goal of the vision statement what we're working to discern now are the stepstones that we use each and every day. Core values, when embraced, uplifted, and used, create incredible avenues for the Spirit to work in our lives and the lives of others. Would you all pray with me, please? Let us struggle with these words and ideas spoken, O God. Struggle not in the way to intimidate or to be fearful or to run away, but struggle in a way to say, I want to hear you, Lord, more than I did before. I want our body to resonate together, Lord, more than it did before. To break the bonds of longevity of relationships, generational association with this house, but a loving God to recognize that each person matters because you have called us all to be here. Allow us truly, O oh God, to pick up one as we look at our values. In your son's precious and most holy name, amen. So as a body of faith, what's important to us? Sorry? <laughs> that was more of a rhetorical question. <laughs> Still a rhetorical question, but good answer. Um, she said walking with Jesus. You know, when I was a kid growing up, what was important and made our church tick was never talked about. A lot of people talked about what was important to them and how things should be done, but not this is what made First Baptist Royal Oak First Baptist Royal Oak. I watched my home church struggle and decline slowly over the years, and it went to the point that it had to merge with a non-denominational, new age, a new, whatever you call it, congregation called Genesis, which when I read their governing documents, I was shocked. It wasn't this is what we believe. It was this is what's important to us. This is what will emulate as a body of faith. It is through these avenues, these steps, these identified values that we will generate community both within our walls and share our community with those outside of our walls. 
it had nothing to do with the ministries of defining it. The values defined the ministries. In other words, God was at the center. I was born and raised and even in seminary taught with that, for lack of a better term, old school mindset. And by the close of this decade, it is expected that 30% of all mainline denominational churches, which this will be one of them, is going to close. And if you look at all of them and you ask the question, well, what are your core values? We believe in God, we believe in Jesus. Yeah, how do you value that? How are you applying that? How are you letting that grow and change you? And they can't answer those questions. Pastors who were trained with the training that I had weren't taught the importance of how to do that. We're both breaking a barrier here together. So as you all stay for the congregational meeting and then go, think about what you've heard. Think about it. Pray about it. My prayer is that you'll wrestle with it. And as we kind of journey through this together, hopefully the Spirit will give us something to apply. But as we go from this place, let us not be ashamed or afraid to let the world know that we are a people of God. Stay in your seats, then go in grace. Be filled with His Spirit. Amen.